Hi everyone, I'm Matt Clark, Research Analyst with Money Markets, and joining me as he does each and every week is Green Zone Fortunes co-editor Charles Sizemore, and we're gonna bring you another episode of Investing with Charles. Now Charles, uh, first off, thank you for joining again, uh, and, and uh, I wanna jump right into it because we've got a lot to kind of unpack here. And uh, I wanna start off with, uh, you know, last week Apple and uh, came out with their big product announcement as they do uh, traditionally in September where they uh, release uh, new products ranging from, you know, new new iPads, new laptops, new computers. This time around, it was an iPhone launch. The iPhone 13 uh, will be coming out just in time for Christmas to perk up Apple sales. Uh, and, and it kind of reminded me of something. And that is, you know, I remember back over the course of the last nine, 10 months, and I, I look at products like the PlayStation 5. Uh, you know, the PlayStation 5 is a highly sought after uh, gaming console by Sony, but you can't find it. Uh, new cars. This is something else. New cars are, are slowly rolling off the line, uh, but much slower than automakers would like and customers would like um, because, you know, production just isn't matching what it was what? pre coronavirus. Drive by a car lot, they're empty. Exactly. Uh, that's, not, that's not hyperbole. They're empty. Yeah, like, uh, most, most of the cars you'll see in the lot are employee cars. Exactly. And, and the reason why PlayStations are hard to find uh, Xboxes are not as difficult, but are difficult to find. And new cars are not rolling off the lot nearly as quickly as everyone would like is for one reason. Well, not one reason, but for well, the main reason for that is the fact that there are is, there is a dr drastic shortage of semiconductor chips. And these chips are used in a wide array uh, of things from your phone. They, they are used in, in your phone. Uh, they're also used in gaming consoles. They're used for digital displays and cars. Uh, they're used in televisions, they're used in uh, your washer and dryer, all these things, semiconductors. Your hot are water heater at this point. You, you think exactly. of something that boring, I, I, I actually had to replace my hot water heater a couple of years ago, and they asked me if I wanted a smart hot water heater, and I said, I, I don't, it, it boils water, man. I mean, what, they're like, yeah, 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 but you can control it from your phone, and it really doesn't cost any more, so you should get it. So I did. So I have a I smart hot water heater. So when Skynet becomes aware and, and decides to wage war on humans, I guess it's just going to shoot hot water at me later. We'll find I, I, out. I, it's exactly what I've always wanted is a hot water heater I can control with my phone. Nonetheless, but, you know, and, and you see the headlines everywhere. You see automakers that are cutting back uh, their production because they just can't get the semiconductor chips from producers that they need to make these vehicles. So I want to kind of dive into that and tackle that a little bit because the semiconductor industry uh, is a very strong industry. It's an industry that, that, that we're seeing upticks in sales, uh, especially after the coronavirus uh, pandemic has, has kind of subsided uh, uh, to a degree, uh, not, notwithstanding the Delta variant. Um, but we're seeing very strong, uh, very strong moves in, in semiconductors. But yet, this is a company. This is a not a company, but a sector that is experiencing wide range shortages. So I want to kind of get your thoughts on that and kind of unpack that a little bit. Yeah, sure. This is something that uh, that Adam really covered in the last issue of, of Green Zone Fortunes, and it, it's it's funny how all this played out. Demand was already tight, or supply was already tight. Demand was already strong. Uh, late 2019, early 2020, like th this has been a, a tight market for a long time. Well, then what happens? You have the onset of the pandemic, you have factory closures, you have everything shut down for a while. Even though factories weren't shut down for that long, in some cases it might've been a few weeks and others maybe a, a couple months, but you know, things started to, workers went back to work and, and, and you know, they, they, got back, they got back to making chips. But just that window of time where production got halted or disrupted, that was enough because you already had really, really tight conditions in place. And then just that one little break in the action there, that was enough to put everybody behind. And they've been struggling to catch up ever since. And we would have had probably some kind of shortage even had there never been a coronavirus, but it's obviously massively, massively expanded by the fact that you had those closures. Well, what, what else? What, what else happened last year that, that, that really threw fuel in the fire? We had a big trade spat with China. And what happened there? A lot of U.S. companies were forbidden from sourcing from China. So you had the other suppliers, and primarily in Taiwan and South Korea, that all of a sudden now have all this new demand from the people that can no longer buy from China. They've already had a tight market to, to start with, and now they're having all this additional demand that they can't satisfy and then as if none of that was enough, 
semiconductors use a lot of water, and it just so happens that Taiwan is dealing with their worst drought in decades. So that act, that further added another impediment to production. So you put all that together, it's a miracle we have a single chip available to buy anywhere. But uh, well, I, maybe we don't. Maybe we, maybe they've sold the last one. I don't know. But uh, that's you know that's kind of how we got here, and getting out of it doesn't happen in a day. So yes, every chip maker in the world is you know, feverishly trying to, to, to raise their, their productive capacity. Taiwan Semiconductor is dumping $100 billion. And I feel like you almost have to do the Dr. Evil thing for that. I mean, like that's a gargantuan amount of money for a single company to be spending on, on new, new, new production. That's huge. Um, Samsung is also dumping in a couple tens of billions. Intel, they're all doing it. They're all dumping in an insane amount of money to build capacity, because for them, this is not just a short term, you know, the, what we see is this short term shortage, but they're looking beyond that. They know that, OK, if, if you raise production to meet this current shortage, you're still going to be short in a couple of years because demand just keeps growing every year. So that's where we are. There is an arms race to build out as much capacity as possible. To put it in perspective, the one billion, the hundred billion dollar investment from uh, Taiwan Semiconductors uh, estimates from the spring of 2021 uh, show that the global semiconductor market size, global, in 2021 is estimated at 527 billion dollars. Taiwan Semiconductors is investing one fifth of the entire global market size of semiconductors to increase capacity. Yeah. And the other, thing I think, the other thing I think is important to point out here is that not all semiconductors are the same. So not only do you have these issues with water supply, with trade wars, with production uh, drop-offs because of COVID, you also have to understand that chip makers aren't just making one type of chip. The, same, the chip that goes into my iPhone is not the same that goes into my MacBook or not the same that goes into your uh, display screen or whatnot yeah, yeah. Or, or on your display screen on your car or on your television, on your smart TV. They're not the same. There no. are upwards of five to six to seven, even up to 10 different semiconductor chips that are manufactured at any one given time by any one given company. So that's a lot of foundry work. It, that's not just well, you know, an important line pushing you, and going. You can't, you can't turn that battleship on a dime. You know, it, th this is sensitive equipment. You can't just say, hey, this machine that was turning out iPhone chips, I, I need to make it turn out F-150 chips tomorrow. It, it doesn't work like that. Right? Yeah. that, that's, that that's a process. And that's one of the reasons, uh, that's actually another reason we didn't even touch on. Um, the, what happened specifically with cars? Well, when everything was shut down during the pandemic, the rental companies, for example, just unloaded all their inventory, just got rid of it. Well, now all of a sudden they need it all back and all the, the, the foundries, all, all the chip makers had retooled their factories to do things other than cars because nobody imagined auto, uh, auto sales would rebound as quickly as they did. So that's yet another, <laughs> yet another just canister of gasoline to throw in that raging inferno. So, and it's, and, and I think you're right. It's going to take a while. This is not going to be something that solves itself in a day or a month or even a year. I think, uh, I think we're going to, I mean, we've seen PlayStation five shortages for the better part of 2021 since they were announced in, I think, November of 2020, uh, there has been a, a widespread shortage and now it's basically black market for a PlayStation five. It's, it's go to, you got to buy it from some guy in a trench coat in a dark alley, pretty much, basically, which, which I have looked into to get my son a new video card for his computer. I, I you can't, they're, they're not available. No, and you're going to spend double or triple what the retail price is for, for that piece of equipment if you want it bad enough. And people are spending it. So If you want it um, bad enough. And again, you got to meet that, that proverbial dude in a trench coat in a dark alley in order to get it. <laughs> Which is just <laughs> ominous in and of itself. So <laughs> now I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. Not, well, not too much, but I want to kind of pick your brain and see, you know, is there a way that investors can play this? Uh, and, and be smart in terms of, you know, I, I hate to say profiting off of this, but that's exactly what we're looking at is, is there a way that investors can, uh, you know, eyeball a, a, a particular part of the semiconductor industry and profit off of, off of this, this, this hopefully short-term uh, drawback in semiconductor production? Well, to start, there is no shame at all in trying to profit from this. This is a market dynamic. That if you're, you're buying stock of the companies that are trying to fix this problem for everyone. So there's nothing... There's nothing, uh, nothing dodgy about that. Like that's like th these companies need capital to fix the problem. So you're actually part of the solution in this case. 
But um, there, there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can, of course, just buy the chip makers themselves, and that's fine. You'll likely do well just buying a portfolio of the actual chip makers. Uh, but when you when you run those chip ma chip makers through our, uh, our our green zone model. There's a couple of things that, that really stand out. A lot of them rate very poorly on our volatility factor and on our value factor. Value you, you sort of get because anything tech related is fairly expensive these days, but volatility as well, because the, the chip making industry tends to be cyclical. Now, right now we're very clearly on, a, on the upswing, but chip makers themselves have, you know, the, the, their, their profits really vary wildly from quarter to quarter. So what I like better, I, I, what I think the better course of action is, is don't buy the chip makers themselves, buy the suppliers to the chip makers. That way you get, you get exposure to the same trend. This, this trend is gonna be with us for years and you're getting exposure to that, but you're, you should avoid a lot of the day-to-day -day volatility or quarter-to-quarter -quarter volatility because in buying the suppliers, these tend to be longer term contracts. If you're buying a ton of capital equipment to go you know, build that Taiwan semiconductor you know, growth project we've been talking about, that's a multi-year deal. Like that is not something that's just going to vary wildly from quarter to quarter. That is going to take a long time to build out. So if you're part of that solution, if you're, if you're supplying that, you have really good earnings visibility for a long time to come. So I think that's the safer and, and, and ultimately better way to play that. And, and one company, you know, comes to mind here, and, and I know you and I were talking back and forth about this company, uh, even over the weekend, uh, and, and that is ASML Holding. Yep. Uh, this is a company that is, it's a, it's a European company. Uh, they do not make chips, but they instead supply foundries with equipment they need to make these chips. And, and this is one. And, and in fact, on their website, they have it just sprawled out in print. We provide chip makers with everything they need. Boom. <laughs> there, there you go. It doesn't, get much, it doesn't get much simpler than that. Well, they, they really just dumb it down for all this right there. What exactly is it that your tech company does? Because it's, it's, it's complicated. No, we supply chip makers. We give them what they need. Hardware, software, services. We just supply the chip makers what they need to make chips. Okay, this company well, that's simple. I get that. Yeah, this company trades on the NASDAQ. Its ticker symbol is ASML. Uh, right now, uh, according to our green zone rating model, it does uh, rate a 76, which it puts it in bullish territory for us. It does make it a buy, and we expect it to outperform the market by at least two times over the next 12 months. Um, right now, it rates in the green in, in four of our six categories. If you uh, remember, we do have uh, six different categories, six different metrics that we look at, three fundamental being value, quality, and growth. And then we have three that are more, more technical based, which is a momentum size and volatility. So uh, uh, it rates uh, in the green in four of those. It rates very high in 98 in quality uh, and an 89 in momentum, as well as an 89 in volatility, and then an 83 in growth. Now, uh, Charles, you alluded to this a little bit, and that is value. Uh, you know, ASML does rate a 10 in value, but again, a lot of tech stocks are very much overvalued at this point. Well, so it's not, it's not just that. It's also, look, you tend to pay up for growth. You tend to pay up for quality. This is a high growth and high quality company. So it's extraordinarily rare to find a stock that rates really high on quality and growth, and yet is also cheap. That's almost uh, you know, that, that proverbial unicorn that, I mean, you find them, they exist. We find them fairly regularly but they're not super common. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, and ASML also does rate an eight on size, but that's only because it has a market cap of right around $352 billion. It is a big company, big company. Uh, that, is, that is based in Europe. And this is just one of those, um, I, I don't know, no, necessarily want to say it's a pick and shovel play uh, on semiconductors, but it is one of those where uh, you're not necessarily going into the chip maker themselves. You're not necessarily going into a Taiwan semiconductor or a uh, Qualcomm, if you will. Qualcomm doesn't really manufacture their own chips, but uh, they are a big player in the chip in the chip making industry. Uh, this is a company that is, you know, kind of underneath that and it supplies equipment to those companies to help them with their foundry efforts. So uh, yeah. this is one way definitely to play it. And I, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the fact that um, while that is, uh, that is a good solid recommendation, I think uh, there is one that is even better in this space that Adam O'Dell just came out with uh, just over the weekend. 
uh, and it is actually a semiconductor play that rates even higher in his Green Zone Fortunes uh, uh, you know, service. So I would encourage you. Well, and, and very similar to this, it, it, it's a supplier to the semiconductor makers. It, it's yes. very like, like the, the bullish uh, thesis on this is very similar. It's just a higher rated stock that we mm -hmm. assume will do even better. Exactly. So if you if you want more information on that, I would encourage you uh, to uh, sign up for our Green Zone Fortunes uh, service. We'll try to put a link up in the up in the corner over here uh, to tell you more about it. But uh, Charles, you know, if you had to take best guess here, you know, when do we get back on track with uh, semiconductor production? Oh, good night. It'll be at least six to twelve months before they. If if you read, you know, read what the CEOs themselves are saying, and they're it's all a very consistent story of. We're doing everything we can. We're running our factories at you know actually greater than capacity. They're actually running their their their, their foundries and their factories at a higher capacity than is recommended. <laughs> they are uh, you know to, to, to quote Star Trek, they're giving her all all she's got, Captain. You know, they're, they're and and it's not enough. And and they say it, it shouldn't be enough for it won't be enough for another you know six to twelve months minimum. So this trend's going to be with us for a while. But to recap, uh, you know, semiconductor, it, it, the semiconductor industry is still very, very strong. Uh, but now we have a supply and demand issue where the supply is not meeting the demand. Uh, Charles and I are telling you that one potential company to look at as an investment to play here is ASML Holdings, trades on the NASDAQ under ASML. Uh, by all means, go to, go to moneymarkets.com and uh, check out that ticker symbol in, in, our, uh, in our green zone model up in the top corner. Just type in ASML and you'll be able to see kind of how the ratings all shake out and plus what the company is and, and its stock chart and all that good stuff. You can do all that at moneyandmarkets.com. Charles, I uh, appreciate the time. Love it. Uh, love spending time with each and every week uh, talking about these types of things. And we're going to do it again next week. Yes, sir. Very good. If you uh, have any questions or anything like that for Charles, myself, or Adam O'Dell, email them to us at feedback at moneyandmarkets.com. So for Charles Sizemore, Green, uh, Green Zone Fortunes co-editor, I am Matt Clark, Money and Markets Research Analyst, wishing everyone safe trading. <laughs>